I shot 30,000 images in three days while visiting Strasbourg to capture this time-lapse movie. Let me show you from start to finish how I have done that. Strasbourg is an old French town and it's the perfect location for a time-lapse movie. There are beautiful buildings all around Strasbourg and there is a river running through the heart of the town and of course we do have a ton of people visiting the city. However, to produce a high quality time lapse, there are some preparations involved. So let's go through them real quick. Most importantly, of course, the locations. You want to know all the important locations before you get there. This means before you're heading there, you want to do a little bit of research and what I use mostly here is Google Maps and Google Street View. Those are honestly the best tools to plan your photography trips. But to start the research, it also really helps to just do a simple Google search like show me the top 10 spots of Strasbourg. You will get spammed with tons of websites showing you the same exact top 10 lists, but you will get a very good idea of the locations and which one are actually worth visiting. As you're building your location list, keep in mind to not overload it. In my case, since I only had a few days there, I knew I could never cover all the locations I would want to visit there. Instead, I had my list of locations I absolutely had to shoot and while walking from point A to point B, I always was on the lookout for nice spots to shoot. The important thing when scouting those locations is, these spots do need to fulfill other criteria than our regular photo spots. As I want to capture a time lapse, I need to include motion in the composition. In the most classical sense, motion for a time lapse video would be clouds in the sky. But for a touristy area like Strasbourg, of course we have a ton of people walking around in the street which makes a really good motion element for our time lapse. Another thing we can add is something like cars or trams on the road, or in like the case of Strasbourg, even the boats running up and down the rivers. So always be on the lookout for something that is moving. Shooting a time lapse without any moving elements would not make much sense. Now let's talk about the camera settings. Shooting a few minutes long time lapse in the span of three days is hard. For my time lapse work, I usually use something like 30 frames per second, and this makes the time lapse just look a lot smoother. But this at the same time means 30 images equal one second of footage. In other words, to make it to three minutes or 180 seconds, you would require at least 5,400 images to fill that. And you also have to keep in mind, not everything you're shooting will turn out good. So of all the images you shoot, you will probably filter out a lot. Remember, as I stated in the intro, I shot 30,000 images for this time lapse, but it's only two minutes, 30 seconds long. So you can make a pretty good guess on how much I not included in this video. And here at this point, the interval with which you take the images come into play. People unfamiliar with time lapses think it takes many, many hours to record a time lapse sequence. And in certain cases, that would be true. Just think of construction work. Recording the building of a construction site can take several months to finish. Constructions are usually a super, super slow thing to record. However, compared to the people walking around in the city of Strasbourg, that is rather fast paced. This means instead of taking an image every minute or so, we want to take an image every second or even faster. And that not only counts for the people walking around in the streets, but also for the cars and the trams on the road or for the boats I mentioned before. So by taking a photo every second, we get some pretty nice motion. Taking a photo every three seconds would change things quite dramatically. It would basically make everything a lot faster and thus it would kind of overload our brain with motion and in the end it just would not look good. And that is not what we want. And another thing that is important when thinking about the interval is the focal length you're using when shooting the time lapse. To give you a comparison, Shooting at one image a second makes people seem a lot faster zoomed in with a tele lens than zoomed out with a wide angle lens. And that is because people are covering a way bigger distance in one second zoomed in than zoomed out. Now about the shutter speed. Here we are pretty set on a tiny tiny range. 
As an example, using ultra fast shutter speeds will make our footage look very, very choppy because we are just lacking the motion blur. On the other hand, using slow shutter speeds, we might end up with too much motion blur. And this results in us losing details in our images, which we actually need. I found the perfect spot for the shutter speed to be right about 0.3 seconds. And that's with a wide angle lens. If you would be using a tele lens, I would suggest to use a little bit shorter shutter speed to compensate for the zoomed in effect I previously mentioned. Using those shutter speeds, we will end up with the perfect amount of motion blur while still having lots of details in the image to focus on. For the best possible image quality, if you're using a shutter speed of 0.3 seconds, the interval would have to be 0.6 seconds. So just a double the amount. However, I have to say I did not really follow this rule and I'm still quite happy with the footage I got. So I'm not sure if this makes a big image quality difference. It's just good to know this rule exists. Then we have another important setting to consider when recording timelapse, the aperture. Usually for landscape photography, I tend to use a very low aperture, right about f16 maybe, to get the sharpest results for my images. However, using smaller apertures like that while shooting time-lapse can result in flickering. And that's something we want to prevent. We can fix that in post, but of course it's always better to get it right in camera. And we can do that by shooting with a wide open aperture. So let's say just right about f4 for example. So, with the shutter speed being rather slow and the aperture wide open, this will lead us to some problems. Some of you might already guess it, but shooting with those settings during the day will probably overexpose the image. However, we can make use of certain types of filters to counter that problem. But more on the gear aspect of this time-lapse movie in a minute. Before that, however, I want to talk about a few of those special techniques I used in this movie. Although I have specified some of the best settings to use just a moment ago, of course there are exceptions to them. Let's take a look at this day to night time lapse. Here using static shutter speed aperture or ISO will not work because of course the light situation is changing. We are starting with a bright day and we are going into the night. So the exposure needs to be adjusted. Doing this manually is pretty much impossible. So instead of using the camera's manual mode, what we can do for those day to night or night to day time lapse sequences is to just use the camera's shutter priority mode. What this does basically is we are setting a fixed shutter speed. So in our example for the time lapse, we are using 0.3 seconds and the camera will then adjust the ISO and the aperture automatically with the changing light conditions. But this combined with the fact that the light was changing in turn means we will end up with camera flickering and this is something we need to fix in post. I don't think we can actually fix that in camera. Another technique I used in this video is called hyperlapse and hyperlapses are always super fun to watch. Basically, you take a picture, then you move the camera a bit, take another picture, move the camera again, and so on. In a sense, this is what a motorized slider does, just in a much bigger scale, since you are not limited by the range of your slider. But of course, in order for this to work properly, you need to pay attention to a few things. First and most importantly, you want to make sure the grid view is enabled on your camera display. For the hyperlapse, we want to find a point and align it to the grid view. And we want that point to be in that fixed exact position as we are moving along the path for the hyperlapse. This way we are making sure to get a steady, good looking motion. Of course, doing this perfectly is not possible and looking at the footage later, you will notice some shaking. But don't worry, that's what we have Premiere Pro's Warp Stabilizer for. This will pretty much get rid of all the shaking for us. So not only do we need the camera to be locked on that one specific point, we also need to make sure we're always moving the camera the same distance. In a city like Strasbourg, that is pretty easy since I'm just orientating myself on the paving stone below on the ground. So it pretty much goes like this. 
I'm taking an image, then I'm skipping one paving stone and then take another image. And I'm continuing my way all along the path for the hyperlapse. But to be honest, the first hyperlapses I took were really hot garbage. It does take a little bit of practice, so don't expect too much from your first hyperlapse, I would say. One more popular effect I used for this video was the so-called tilt shift effect. This effect pretty much turns everything into a tiny toy world, especially with the look of movement in time-lapse video. This effect was not created in post, instead I bought a specialized tilt shift lens like this one right here, with which you can easily create this effect. And all you need to do to achieve this is you have to kind of bend the lens tube like this, and this will create one sharp line going through the image while everything outside of this line will be pretty much out of focus. So what gear did I actually use for this movie? Most importantly, I shot this time lapse on two cameras, since two cameras allow me to record double the amount of footage. This was a really big time saver. I used the Sony A7 III as my main camera, while I used my Canon 60 as my backup camera. Also, I wanted to cover a huge focal length range, so let's start this by showing off my 16 to 35 mm Canon lens, which I quite loved during this shoot. Then I also had the Canon 24 to 105 mm lens, which I also really, really loved for this. And for the close up shots, I used the Sigma 70 to 300 mm lens. And of course the TT Artisan 50mm for the tilt shift effect. And to be able to use the previously mentioned camera settings with the slow shutter speed and the high aperture, you want to use different sets of ND filters just to be able to expose your images in that certain way. And of course I was always using a polarizing filter just to push the saturation some more, get rid of reflection, and the only time I did not use filters was during the nighttime because street light shining into the camera lens while there are filters attached makes it look a little bit strange sometimes with weird light reflexes. And finally, two cameras of course require two tripods. And finally, let's take a look at the post-production. All the images were edited in Lightroom, including color grading and masking, and to export the images, turn them into a video sequence, I use the Alert Timelapse software. If you are shooting timelapse, you have to use the software. This is really the best invention since the wheel. Really, there is no competition to it. So using Alert Timelapse, you can create videos straight out of Lightroom. You can set the resolution, set the frame rate, set the file format, and even add something like motion blur if you want. So really great help. In order to cut the video, I use Premiere Pro. Handling these files takes a lot of performance. So if you want to cut time-lapse movies, I really suggest to create proxy files. So you basically take the high resolution video, turn it into a small resolution clip, and this way you can fluently cut your project. And in the end, when rendering the video, the high resolution clips will be used again. And then for the special effects like those zoom transitions, I simply used a bit of After Effects. And that's how I created this time-lapse movie. If you haven't watched it yet, it would really mean a lot to me if you would do. You can find it on my second channel or the link right here. Let me know if I forgot anything you were interested in and thank you so much for watching this video.